I'll get started. Um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is September 7th, 2022, and I call this meeting to order. So first thing, um, the staff here has recommended a social equity status denial. So um, we need to enter into executive session later in this meeting to discuss the specifics of that case. Um, we'll do so after Bryn reviews the applications um, and then um, before we actually vote on those recommendations. Uh, just a quick note on inventory tracking. I know there's a lot of questions about how to comply um, with the board's record keeping and inventory tracking requirements. Um, we have developed specific data points that each licensee will need um, to track and report back to the board. Um, we're currently entering into a contract. It's taking a little bit longer than expected um, to help integrate um, the, this reporting and data entry aspect of this work into our licensing portal. So you have kind of a one-stop shop um, to report your inventory as well as kind of do your renewals or, or start an application. Um, in the meantime, each licensee will be required to report this information to the CCB electronically through a form that will be available on our website. Um, the Agency of Digital Services, um, which is a state kind of IT uh, department, has built these forms for us. They needed some tweaking, and so they're not ready for today. But at our meeting next week, our compliance team is going to conduct a tutorial on how to collect inventory records for each license type and how to report this information to the board using these online forms. Um, quick licensing update. Um, we don't have a long list up for approval today, um, we are, but we are getting very close on a few retail applications as well as the um, integrated license applications. Just a reminder that our compliance team uh, we'll need to do a site vis visit for every operation prior to us issuing a license. So if you have a pending application and you haven't been visited by one of our inspectors yet, we will be in touch to set that up. Um, other than that, I don't think I have anything. Um, so uh, why don't we go ahead and approve the minutes from our last meeting, which was on August 31st. You guys had a chance to look at those? Yes. Yep. All right. Is there a motion to approve them? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, Bryn, I think uh, I'll turn things over to you to review the kind of applications that are up um, for today. Okay, so here is um, your register for this week. Um, and as usual, we are starting with the Canvas program. Um, you can see that staff received um, 23 new patient applications and 31 renewal applications and wound up issuing 51 patient cards um, in the last seven days. New um, or renewal caregiver applications um, are about five, and uh, staff approved three caregiver applications and issued four employee dispensary employee cards. Um, and our numbers, we are still about four days outside of um, our 30-day threshold. Staff are processing applications received on or after August 3rd. So still working to come into compliance with statute there. Um, I'll move on to uh, the license application numbers, um, which are current as of today. I'm going to scroll down a little bit so you can see the bottom here, the totals. Um, one thing that's worth noting is that um, this is the first board meeting that we have more applications that are in the approved or category than we have still in process. Um, so we have um, about 215 that have been issued or approved before um, the applications that are up for approval this week. And we have um, about 192 in the queue. So we have 
more that we have processed than we then are waiting to be processed. Um, so that's a first. So again, as the chair mentioned, we have just five up for review this week. Um, and you can see we have a number of retailers that are under review, at about four that are like in review process or resubmitted. Um, and for manufacturers, we have um, one that is in resubmitted status, which is getting quite close at the tier three manufacturer and um, about six um, tier two manufacturers that are um, in the review process. So I'll scroll down to the staff recommendations for a license. This is our list this week. Um, so we have just five up for your review. We've got um, weed connections applying for an indoor tier one, um, cremation solutions applying for an outdoor tier one, horticultural professionals applying for a mixed tier two. Demeter's DG is applying for a tier three indoor and first branch cannabis applying for a mixed tier two. And then our we have our short list of license amendments here to show um, where we are with the amendment process. About five total in the process of amending their applications. And then lastly, we have our social equity uh, numbers here. Um, and as the chair mentioned, we have one social equity applicant um, who is up for review today. Staff is recommending a denial for submission 755, denial of social equity status, as they um, don't meet the criteria for social equity business applicant as defined in the rule. And we can discuss that in executive session. Um, Bernadette, a quick question for you. Um, sure. When I was looking, when I saw the register just then, it looked like there was one um, integrated license. Uh, I think historically we've had two in that category. Is that, is it just, is one, it had one in kind of process and one in dismiss. Yep. That, um, okay, it does look like that's an error in the spreadsheet. So, okay. We will get that fixed. All right. Um, other than that, I think this looks great. And thanks for all the kind of hard work to getting us, you know, in more approved than pending. Yep. That is a very exciting. Well, um, I think uh, we should do an executive session to discuss the kind of rationale behind the denial recommendation. Um, I think Susanna is going to join us for that as well. Yes. Is there a motion to do that? I move that the CCB go into executive session to consider confidential attorney client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the body and that executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at substantial disadvantage. I further move that the board invite Susanna Davis and Jay Green from the uh, Department of Racial Equity uh, into executive session. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So just as a time check, it's 135. Um, we ended just 10 minutes earlier than expected. Um, but uh, so we are out of executive session now. We are joined by Susanna Davis and Jay Green um, from the Office of Racial Equity. And um, we reviewed the kind of facts behind a staff recommendation um, to deny social equity status. And I think we are now ready to vote on all staff recommendations. So is there a motion for that? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations as presented to us by staff in this meeting. I second. Any discussion before we vote? Nope. Nope. Not this week. All right. Well, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right. Why don't we um, go ahead and 
move to public comment. Um, we'll start with the people that join via the link via video. Uh, if you have a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. Um, we'll try our best to call on you in the order that you raise your hand. And um, then we'll move to folks that join via the phone. Dave is first. Hey, I think uh, a lot of folks might might not be uh, back yet. Um, the uh, in general, kind of general comment about the exact sessions and uh, where you look at social equity applicants. I think it would be a helpful thing for the market if there were like some general criteria that are frequently being looked at in these executive session denials uh, that you could share that out. Um, you know, I have some clients who I think are borderline cases or actually kind of poor cases for social equity uh, that I've been discouraging from aggressively applying because I just don't think they fit. Um, but it would be nice to kind of know why folks are getting rejected, you know, in a way that doesn't, uh, you know, divulge any kind of private information that cannot be shared. So uh, please consider that. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Michael Denault here, um, Charles River Insurance. We're helping out uh, providing insurance solutions for the new industry here. Um, I have come on once before talking about the uh, residential exposure for insurance um, and how it was a very big conflict because there were no options available. Um, I did want to let the board know that uh, we do have a solution finally uh, that we've been working on since April uh, as soon as the uh, new licenses were uh, announced. Uh, this is something where it is an explicit uh, inclusion for a residential exposure. So I did want to let the board know that um, I am available to uh, send that over to you for reference uh, to show you the language uh, from a legal standpoint, how that does incorporate into the licensing process. Um, and for anybody else on the call, um, again, Michael Denault at Charles River Insurance, happy to help out with the home uh, businesses. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Michael. I'll be in touch and maybe we can kind of get this information out to the Vermont industry. Um, Tito? Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I love seeing all these approved licenses, but I still cringe every time I see the town names disclosed. Um, I I just don't understand why. I know you you guys have been saying for transparency, um, disclosing the county definitely still uh, adds to transparency. But at least it makes it a little bit harder for pro thieves to find us. That's all. Thank you. Hope you're all having a great day. Yep. Thanks, Tito. Um, I see it's per P E R. Hello. Hey. Yeah. Hi. This is Per Per Arnberg with Dahlen Ltd. How you doing? Um, doing fine, thanks. Um, so, just a few questions that we have um, regarding. Uh, we are applying for uh, a set of licenses. We've already received manufacturing and cultivation, applying for retail, and some questions regarding the product approval process and packaging and labeling. Um, so it's quite a few questions. I'll just try and keep it as short as possible. Um, we understand that um, individual products are going to have to be um, approved by the CCB prior to being sold in the retail space. Is there information out on that yet? We've been looking and we haven't seemed to find any. We also know that there's this um, fee for each individual product that's going to be approved by the CCB to be sold. We believe it's $50. Um, what is that process and is that portal open yet? Um, and how do we submit for, for individual products? Um, and also around that, the language from what we've seen seems to be a little bit vague on, is this for, let's take the category of flour for each individual strain for flour in general, like IE, if you have five types of flour, is it $50 per individual strain? And then for approval, are we talking about approval on a per gram per, you know, 
uh, per each individual SKU or an overall category of product. Um, then in terms of packaging, a little bit uh, regarding your pre-approval of certain packaging or your waivers, um, some of the items there we're curious about, so like the baggie, the paper baggie, for example, because of your waiver, is that something that can be utilized, the same packaging from the same brand in different sizes? Uh, because to me, for from our understanding, it looks like it's that one specific size. And same thing, you've got a, um, I think it's a, a plastic cap as well with a waiver. Um, and from what we can see, that only really fits with the glass um, uh, package that you know it screws onto from that same company and or they have a full um, recycled plastic vial. So if that brands, that specific plastic has been or recycled plastic has been given a waiver, does that also fit for other products from that same manufacturer, from that same type of product? Um, and with that being said, we've also been trying to go through the packaging. Um, one thing that we see that we're a little bit confused on is the issue of opacity, like uh, opaque uh, packaging, so you can't see what's inside. And considering something like a glass jar, you guys have approved mason jars or you know glass jars with screw tops. Um, does glass or, or packaging need to be 100% opaque? Like, what's the definition here? Um, because in that case, I, we would imagine that any glass jars that are not black um, would be out of the running um, from that side of things. Um, and then we're also looking for some clarity on um, child resistance and tamper evidence. Um, because like with the glass jars, flip top jars, from what we've been able to find, and if there are solutions, we'd love to hear them. Um, from what we understand the definitions of something like child resistant, those screw top glass jars, we wouldn't think would fit that, but maybe we're wrong or, or something in that sense. And same thing with like some of the products you've given waivers to, like again, that, that um, paper baggie, is that considered child resistant because it can be uh, heat sealed at the top and it has that rip top? Or how does that fulfill the, the tamper evident and the child resistant packaging? And then on to labeling, and I'm sorry, I know I'm taking up quite a bit of time, but this is important, is um, there's a lot of information that needs to fit on some of these labels. And we understand from your guidelines that there are different ways to attach them and so on. We're a little bit curious about um, things like the dropper vials and with the peel back labels, um, some further guidance on what needs to be on the outside surface versus what can be underneath, you know, on the peel back label. And for something like a little concentrate uh, jar uh, that can be extremely small sized, there's nearly no way that we found, at least with the text and size of text requirements that CCB has put forth to fit that. And we understand there's ways to tape on and attach. Um, we'd like a little bit more clarification around that. Can it be uh, the information, the labels, you know, attached somehow in a baggie when they're being sold or what? Because with some products, it just seems like it's almost impossible to, to fit all of that on. Um, so I, I know that was a lot of different questions and appreciate you know, your guys' time and hope to hear some answers back on it. We're going to email you as well with some of this stuff. Yeah, that's great. Those are all really good questions and all things that um, we've been discussing internally and we'll hopefully have some answers for you um, very soon. We know that this is kind of a critical moment for all the packaging and labeling. Um, Chris Vickers. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm a tier one cultivator and I am uh, gonna be applying for my manufacturing license. And uh, <clears throat> I kind of wish that these two things were rolled together somehow where most people who are cultivating are gonna wanna do something else with their other products that they have, their lower buds or turning it into other things. And I feel like going through the application process again, another thousand dollars, another license fee, doesn't really make sense unless you're gonna be bringing in other product from other people and processing that. Thought maybe you could try to roll that into tier one and make it part of something where you can take your own product and turn it into whatever you want, joints, materials, hash, without having to reapply and do another license. Just an idea. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.
Anyone else uh, who joined via the link, please just raise your virtual hand. Um, if you joined via the phone and would like to make a public comment, um, hit star six to unmute your phone. Keith? Hello, CCB. I have a question. Will you be requiring all employees to have safe vendor training and a safe vendor training course applied to all employees that apply for retail sales businesses? And my other question is, do all retail sales businesses have to be a separate building and not adjoining to any other building or any other building that is operating a business within that business already? So they would be a single business in that as is with all the security parameters of two door locks, security cameras, and ID check machines, and anything like that. And I'd like to see safe vendor training because I think the CCB should have it as well. And all employees and all staff of the CCB should have some type of safe vendor training because going into this blindly, most people are not gonna know how to do this. And there's gotta be some parameters of education to get people out there when they start working in these retail stores. Yeah, thanks for the comment, Keith. Again, we don't generally answer questions just directly during the public comment period. Um, you know, it would very quickly convert to just a question and answer session, which really isn't the point of a public comment period, but I appreciate the questions. And um, I know that our education requirements are in our rule. Um, and, um, you know, you can kind of see some of the, I think the answers to your other questions are, are pretty clear in our rules. But um, anyway, anyone else for a public comment? Okay. Well, thank you all for joining today. Thanks for to the staff for all their hard work this week. And um, thank you, Julie and Kyle. Um, I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Likewise, and thank you.